Hello, and welcome to the 2021 Newberry Caldecott Legacy Virtual Banquet. My name is Kirby McCurtis, and I am the president of the Association for Library Service to Children, also known as ALSC. A year full of change and loss has passed since last year's ceremony. Through it all, authors and illustrators have continued to imagine and inspire hopeful futures for children through their work. We are here to honor these distinguished creators whose works have offered engrossing and beautiful worlds to us all in 2020. This year's winning titles radiate with their creators' storied backgrounds, voices, and legacies of greatness, and I am so grateful that we can hear from them. We will start with the presentation of the Randolph Caldecott Medal, followed by the John Newbery Medal, and finally the Children's Literature Legacy Award. Before the presentation of awards, I would like to acknowledge everyone who makes ALSC thrive. The members of the 2020 and 2021 ALSC Board of Directors, the enthusiastic and devoted ALSC staff that support the board and ALSC's members, and the 2021 Newberry, Caldecott, and Legacy Committees, guided by ALSC Priority Group Consultant, Kathy Meisner. I am delighted that so many of you are watching this event. We are also joined by past presidents of the association, publishers, editors, authors, illustrators, vendors, members, and many others whose work to support library service and literature for children. Special thanks to the honored publishers who have donated to the Melcher Scholarship Fund, to the corporate sponsors of ALSC's professional awards and scholarships, and to the Friends of ALSC. Your donations enhance all of our programs and services, and we thank you for your continued support. Thanks to all of you for joining us and your dedication, work, and friendship to ALSC and its mission. You help make us what we are. For their continued commitment and collaboration in reaching our shared goal of equitable library service to youth, I thank the American Association of School Librarians and the Young Adult Library Services Association and ALA affiliate Reforma, the National Association to Promote Library and Information Services to Latinos and the Spanish Speaking, our partners in the Belpre Award. Finally, the many roundtables and affiliates of ALA who join us in promoting incredible children's books, which celebrate the variety and diversity of children's literature. Now let's begin the awards presentation with the chair of the 2021 Randolph Caldecott Selection Committee, Anisha Jeffries. Hello, my name is Anisha Jeffries and I am the chair of the 2021 Randolph Caldecott Selection Committee. The Randolph Caldecott Medal is awarded annually to the illustrator of the most distinguished picture book for children published in the United States in the preceding year. I would like to thank the 2021 committee for all of their hard work, being supportive and their tenaciousness through the challenges we encountered while quarantined away from our workplace and families. During it all, we were able to find laughter and encourage one another during the most difficult times through our love and appreciation of picture books. Our committee chose four honor books. A Place Inside of Me, a poem to heal the heart, illustrated by Nora Denman, written by Zeta Elliott, and published by Farrar Strauss Juru, Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. Noah Denman's strategic use of light, dark colors and urban environments augment a black child's emotional range from joy and then sorrow and anger when he learns news of a shooting and subsequently hope and love. Community solidarity representation of Black Lives Matter and images of cultural icons such as Beyonce, Malcolm X, and others add to the power of art. 
Hello, everyone, and thank you so much to the American Library Association for recognizing this book, A Place Inside of Me. Um, as my debut children's book, it really has such a special place in my heart. It was a really emotional project that I felt really helped me connect with some of my experiences as a person of color. So I hope that all the friends and fans who read this book will connect with this little boy as well and um, remember to love themselves most of all. Thanks so much. The Cat Man of Aleppo, illustrated by Yuko Shimizu, written by Irene Latham and Kareem Shimizu Basha, and published by G.P. Putnam Sons Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Penguin Young Readers, a division of Penguin Random House. War-torn Aleppo is given hope from Muhammad Allah Al Jalil's humanitarian efforts to care for the deserted cats in the city. Shimizu's digitally colored black ink images build a powerful sense of place with thoughtful details and varied perspectives leading us from scenes of desolation to ones of joy and optimism. I did suffer from an imposter syndrome while working on it and even after the book was published. The least I could do was to research as much as I can and ended up spending about half a year just learning about the subject before I started drawing. Thank you, Cecilia, Stacy, Irene, and everyone from Penguin Putnam, and also authors Irene and Karen for believing me. Thank you. Me and Mama illustrated and written by Cosby A. Cabrera and published by Deneen Milner Books, Simon and Schuster Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Simon and Schuster. Cosby A. Cabrera captures a young girl's adoration for her mother in a series of masterful acrylic paintings that chronicle a day in their lives. Light, textured, and vibrant color imbue each moment with love, telling a universal yet an exquisitely specific story that centers everyday Black joy. Thank you, Caldecott Selection Committee, for choosing me and Mama for a Caldecott honor. Thank you to Denise Milner Books, Simon & Schuster, Victoria Sanders & Associates, and with the five seconds I've got left, I will attempt to pantomime receiving a Caldecott honor. So, so much. Outside In, illustrated by Cindy Derby, written by Deborah Underwood, and published by Hooten Mifflin Harcourt. Cindy Derby's brilliant use of watercolor, powdered graphite, and dried flower stems soaked in ink beckons young readers to reflect on the outdoors and their place in the world. Thank you so much to the Caldecott Committee for this beautiful honor, and thank you to the entire team at HMH, also my agent Jennifer Lofren, and of course to Deborah Underwood. Also, thank you to the snail that uh, made its way into my apartment and kept me company while I was making art for this book. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed your shaved carrots and uh, fancy meals that I fed you. Okay, bye. And the recipient of the 2021 Randolph Caldecott Medal for the most distinguished picture book for children is We Are Water Protectors illustrated by Michaela Gold, written by Carol Lindstrom, and published by Roaring Brook Press, an imprint of Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. Michaela Gold's vivid swirling watercolors capture the sacredness of water and amplify Carol Lindstrom's passionate call to action and celebration of indigenous ancestry and community.
Rich symbolism and repeating floral patterns appear alongside distinctive colors and atmospheric light to tenderly frame the defiant young protagonist standing up against the real life horrors of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Shinge Khinach Ye Khatuasak Shitin. Tle Kha Khinach Kua Mikhail Goat. Kicks Adi Khat City. Shidin hit you do a sak ha naka hidi. Ak ish as ka gwan tan. Shit ka ye khat iati. In Klinket, my name is Shitin. And in English, my name is Mikhail Goat. I'm of the Kiksadi clan. And our clan house is called the Steel House. My father's people are the Khakwantan. I live in Shitka, or what is now known as Sitka, Alaska. I'm speaking to you all from the same lands that my ancestors have stewarded since time immemorial, and I'm honored to be addressing you. It is a daunting thing to be called upon to put into words what I normally choose to communicate through art. There is so much to say and so much I want to get just right. Over the last couple months, as I fretted over this most public of acceptances, I repeatedly asked myself, where do I even begin? As Klingit people, our way of life is based upon our relationship to Ha'ani, our land. Where we come from, who our ancestors are, which animals we claim kinship with, our food, our language, stories, cosmology, traditions, it is all intricately tied to the land. I grew up in Southeast Alaska, the tradi traditional territories of the Klinkit, Haida, and Simshi nations. It is a labyrinth of over 1,000 islands, endless waterways, and wild, rugged coastlines nestled between the mountains of Canada and the Pacific Ocean. It is a place of ethereal and mercurial beauty, abundant in its gifts, yet unforgiving in what it sometimes takes. It is a misty, mountainous, temperate rainforest where sea blends into sky until your childhood memories are a blue-green blur tinged with salt spray. It is rain country, a wonderland dripping in golden moss and lacy lichen. It is home to a dizzying array of flora, fauna, and many animal relatives. It is a kaleidoscope of glaciers and fjords, rivers and waterfalls, lakes, bogs, wetlands, bays, channels, coves, inlet sounds. I think you get the idea. And as is often the case around these parts, everything has a way of eventually leading to the sea. After all, as Tlingit people, we are people of the tides. This is the land that anchors us. This is the water that runs through my veins, runs through my people's veins, as Carol Lindstrom so eloquently wrote. It is why, when I first read her manuscript for We Are Water Protectors, I got goosebumps. Immediately I thought, where do I sign? I hadn't yet learned how rare that burst of clarity can be. The language was poetic yet sparse, powerful in its message. The space around that text was vast. I could envision stretching out and making myself at home, layering a world and that might flow around and within Carol's story and maybe, just maybe, help create something special. Everything has spirit. We are all connected. Yaat une. Respect for all things. Although I didn't know the particulars, I knew that I wanted the art to sing with that truth. If I could communicate this, if the art could help deepen a reader's understanding of what it means to be in relationship with the land, or nourish the spirit of a future water protector, I thought I could do the story justice. Still, I didn't dive in lightly. As I do with every story that crosses my path, I ask myself if I'm the right artist for the job. Does my own lived experience resonate with the story? Will I be able to authentically center indigenous children? Ultimately, will I do harm by taking this story on? These are a few important questions I've learned to ask, at times the hard way. To be indigenous is to know erasure, misrepresentation, and injustice. Many people assume that to be native is to belong to a monolith. But there are over 500 federally recognized native nations across our country and hundreds more beyond that. Each nation has their own land, language, traditions, history, sovereignty. I never presume to know what it's like to be an Ojibwe woman like Carol or a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Nation. I wasn't on the ground in 2016 at the Sacred Stone Camp opposing construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Additionally and significantly, I'm Klinket and also Norwegian, with an extra tangling of Japanese and Northern European roots. 
Being of mixed ancestry, being both native and white, calls for a heightened sensitivity to the numerous privileges I carry in this world and into this work. With these privileges comes a responsibility to keep learning, listening, and working towards representation for all Indigenous peoples. I feel that there's a certain kinship commonly felt between Indigenous peoples, especially where themes of environmental justice and land stewardship are concerned. Before submerging into the story and unbeknownst to our editor, Makisha Telfer, Carol and I hopped on the film. I needed to learn about Carol's people, the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe, her inspiration, her hopes, and her connection to Standing Rock. Carol emphasized that although her story was in essence a love letter to the Standing Rock water protectors, it was truly meant for all. While I chose to root the visual narrative in Carol's Ojibwe culture, I took this universal message to heart. By leaning into cosmic imagery that carried spirit, emotion, and connection, I hoped the book might speak to all. At the same time, I honored Carol's people while providing a framework for layers of symbolism. Whether it was the floral motifs paying homage to the traditional Anishinaabe woodland style, the animals that reflected clans or traditional teachings, or the seven ancestors around the fire representing the seven fires prophecy, I aimed to deepen the reading experience and thus the representation. My hope was that an Ojibwe reader might one day spot the backs of the tur turtles popping out of the water and understand that small reference to Turtle Island or a water protector might recognize the subtle likeness of Josephine Mondaman, an Anishinaabe elder and one of the founders of the water protectors movement, gazing out from the water. I hoped that indigenous children everywhere would see our young hero changing into her, her traditional ribbon skirt as she rallies her people and understand the power of that moment as she embraces tradition while looking towards the future. I also set out to paint a rich tapestry of contemporary indigenous people's lives. The 2016 gathering at Standing Rock was historic. Thousands of water protectors, both native and non-native, congregated in solidarity at the Sacred Stone Camp. It became the largest intertribal alliance in documented history. I wanted the art to highlight this powerful moment and this rich diversity within the unity. Different skin colors, a range of ages, and a wide array, wide array of traditional regalia and contemporary clothing are a few ways I chose to do this. I wanted so badly to make the Standing Rock water protectors proud, but I feared a misstep. I worried I might misrepresent, exclude, or unintentionally offend. So I researched, and then I researched some more. I contemplated how sorrow, frustration, and anger wove together with courage, resiliency, and hope, and how the art might speak to this gravity. I would need to create a visual narrative grounded in tradition and history, yet respect different living cultures. Furthermore, I needed the story to feel timeless, for Standing Rock was not an isolated event. In our country, there is a long dark legacy of broken treaties, of indigenous-led movements to protect their lands. Many are still ongoing. The fights against Coastal Gaslink, Keystone XL, and Line 3 pipelines are just a few that come to mind. These frontline water protectors have long been fighting for all of us, and they need more people to answer the call. Today, there are many young folks who are at the forefront of environmental justice issues. They will inherit this world. In all the books I work on, I hope that Indigenous children leave the story feeling seen and celebrated, because they are so often told the opposite in our world. Additionally, it's vital that non-Native children see these stories centering Native peoples and a multitude of experiences. In this book, it was especially crucial for me that all children, Native and non-Native alike, came away from the experience feeling empowered, like they could make a difference. When We Are Water Protectors was on my painting table, my partner and I had the great fortune of living in a tiny cabin tucked away in the forest next to the sea with an even tinier shed studio just down the path. I was wildly over the moon about every humpback whale that woke us up with its bubble feeding and smacking tail, every exciting storm that rolled down the channel, every bit of precious rainwater that collected in the large tanks beneath the floor. It was an entirely magical world and informed the making of this book in a very real way. I always knew that I wanted water to be a main character in this book, to encourage readers to ask themselves, not what is water, but who? After all, as Carol writes, water has its own spirit. Water is alive. 
I attempted to fill the pages with that reverence and respect. I never know what the final art will look like. And that's part of the fun. Painting becomes a conversation between me and Mother Earth. It becomes another way in which I get to be in relationship with the land, perhaps helping her speak in a way she cannot. It is a way of giving back. From the beginning, this project often felt like it was much, much bigger than me. An odd feeling to reconcile at times when you're working alone in intense isolation, in your pajamas, in a tiny studio by the sea. It felt so much bigger than me that at times I struggled to take credit or talk about it as a personal achievement. I was and am greatly honored to have helped bring this book to life. And I'm proud of what we all created together. It is affirming to know we helped raise awareness of environmental injustice and indigenous rights. But in some ways, it has felt like my role was that of a translator. And now I find myself here in front of you all and I'm still struggling to speak to these feelings. To receive this Caldecott Medal is truly an honor, and apart from being a personal achievement that I'm still processing, I'm the first Indigenous person and BIPOC woman to receive this award in its 83-year history. Over the last few months, I've often been asked what that feels like. In all honesty, the answer is hard to pin down. Firstly, I have so much gratitude for my elders, to those who have helped create opportunities and lifted the next generations up. I am one among many Native bookmakers contributing to a growing canon of beautiful Native children's literature, and that is incredibly encouraging. I am heartened to know that other BIPOC artists may see themselves in this award and feel validated and affirmed in their path. I'm deeply inspired by BIPOC children who may see themselves in this recognition and be reassured that their identities and stories are powerful and needed. I firmly believe that Indigenous wisdom can help change the world. It is powerful to feel that the world is listening. So when I'm asked that question, it makes me look to the horizon, to the Indigenous and BIPOC artists of today and tomorrow, and I'm filled with hope knowing that this is just the beginning. To my fellow awardees, it is an honor to be in your company. Congratulations. And to the many brilliant, book, brilliant books published last year that did not receive recognition, your work matters. I'm inspired by you. To the incredible Native Kid Lake community, Ganeshchish for your encouragement, advice, camaraderie, and overall loving support during these last few years. Carol, Ganeshchish. My dear friend, your words were a gift and they motivated me every single day. Makisha, Gunishchish for your vision and guidance. You saw what this book could be. And to the rest of the Roaring Brook team, thank you for believing in us and providing so much support, especially during these last tumultuous but very exciting months. To my agent Kirsten Hall, thank you for helping me sail these publishing seas. It has been infinitely smoother and ever more delightful with you by my side as a friend. And to Susan Rich, who took a chance on me as my first editor, I am so lucky to call you a friend and mentor. Thank you. To the Standing Rock water protectors and water protectors and land defenders everywhere, Gonishchish for your resilience and courage to fight for Mother Earth in the face of injustice, apathy, and violence. For all of us, so we have a collective future on this planet. You are an inspiration. I'll keep working to honor the fight. And to the 2021 Caldecott Committee, Atleng and Shchish, thank you so much. You truly saw everything that went into this book, and it's still a wonder to think of you all considering it so closely. It's more than I ever dared to dream. Please know that you have my in infinite gratitude. As the river leads to the ocean, we too steered this book towards the wide, wild world and wished it well. Books find their true purpose in the hands of you, dear readers. Books are magic. They can be a first step towards awareness. They can be a call to action. They can help turn the tide. There's always the hope that the ones we get to work on do some good in the world. And you embraced our book so warmly, championed it so passionately, and for that, I am so grateful. You talk to the children in your life about environmental justice, indigenous rights, and how to be in deeper relationship with the sacred waters and land, and how we are all connected. My dream is that this book will encourage those conversations far into the future and ripple out to sea, growing into wave upon wave of collective action. What more could the saltwater soul of mine hope for? After all, 
Mini Johnny, water is life. Gunishish. Greetings. I am Dr. Jonda C. McNair, Chair of the 2021 John Newberry Award Selection Committee. The Newberry Medal is given to an author who makes the most distinguished contribution to American literature for children. It was presented for the first time in 1922, and our committee had the privilege and honor of selecting the 100th Newberry Medal winner. I would like to acknowledge and thank my committee members, Gretchen Schultz, our administrative assistant, and Kathy Meisner, our priority group consultant. I'd also like to thank those individuals, such as ALSC staff, our family members, employers, friends, and any others who provided support and encouragement for us to do this important work. Since its inception, the Newberry Award has been given out during times of national crises, including the Great Depression, wars, and now a pandemic. In spite of all the challenges faced during our term, my committee members remained dedicated to carrying out the charge we had been given. I could not have asked for a better group of individuals to work with. Though we were different in many ways, such as our professions, geographical locations, backgrounds, personal opinions, we were all committed to listening to one another and selecting what we consider to be the most distinguished books for children published in 2020. My committee members have been as fascinating, sharp, charming, lively, beautiful, and special as the fascinators some of them have chosen to wear. And to them, I say, thank you so much. All 13, The Incredible Cave Rescue of the Thai Boys Soccer Team, written by Christina Soon Tornvat, published by Candlewick Press. All 13 exemplifies superb narrative nonfiction writing. This rich account is so engaging and filled with suspense that readers may forget they already know the outcome of this real life event. Hello everyone. Hello to the Newberry Committee. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for this recognition for all 13. I share this award with everyone who helped to make the book, especially Andrea Tompa, my editor at Candlewick Press and the whole team at Candlewick. Um, and also thank you so much to everyone who shared their story with me for this book. Um, telling your story has been the honor of my life, seconded by this one. <laughs> thank you everyone so much. A Wish in the Dark, written by Christina Soon Tornvat, published by Candlewick Press. Short chapters and memorable characters lure readers into the magical world of Chitana, where light equals opportunity. The setting of Chitana is enchanting and provides a magically realistic stage for the plot. Told in alternating perspectives between two characters who face off against one another, Soon Tornvat highlights social disparities and privileges while revealing the value of friendship, justice, and standing strong in the face of challenges and adversity. Well, hello again. I'm back. <laughs> um, thank you so much to the Newberry Committee for this recognition for A Wish in the Dark. This is undoubtedly the book of my heart, and it means the world to me that you have honored it in such an incredible way. Um, and thank you to my mom and my dad for sharing your stories with me. Your stories are my story, and this book would not be here without you. So thank you so, so much. Box. Henry Brown mails himself to freedom. Written by Carol Boston Weatherford. Illustrated by Michelle Wood published by Candlewick Press. The inhumane treatment of enslaved African-Americans drives this true story of Henry Box Brown, a man who shipped himself to Philadelphia in a wooden box. Weatherford uses stanzas of six lines each to emphasize the confines of the box that took him to freedom and a new life. 
These stanzas are augmented with historical records and excerpts from Brown's own writing. Weatherford's poems have relevance for today's readers. The last poem in the book title Axiom reminds us, freedom is fragile, handle with care. Hi, I'm Carol Boston Weatherford, and I am thrilled that the Newberry Medal Committee chose box Henry Brown mails himself to freedom for a Newberry honor. I feel especially blessed that my mother, to whom I dictated my first poem when I was a first grader, was with me at the time that the phone call came to give me the news. Thank you so much. Fighting Words, written by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley, published by Dial Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Penguin Young Readers, a division of Penguin Random House. Bradley delivers a memorable story and a most memorable main character with a realistic dialogue, complex character arcs for main characters, and age-appropriate examinations of some of the most adult topics, while still delivering a tale of realistic hope. Hi, I'm Kimberly Brubaker Bradley, the author of Fighting Words, and I would like to thank the American Library Association very much for recognizing my work with the Newbury Honor this year. I am standing in the world headquarters of Appalachian Literacy Initiative, a nonprofit that ensures that low-income children in the Appalachian region have access to books. Uh, this is a really important issue with me, and I want to also thank ALA and SCWBI, We Need Diverse Books and other organizations for their commitment to the cause of increasing access to books for all. Thanks very much. We Dream of Space, written by Erin Entrada Kelly, published by Green Willow Books, an imprint of HarperCollins Children's Books. Kelly's writing brings the era of the 80s to life and shows how parental strife and the middle school environment affect three siblings in very different ways. In short chapters that follow the Thomas siblings in the days leading up to the Challenger disaster, Kelly constructs three characters with whom readers will easily identify. In We Dream of Space, the Nelson Thomas children feel invisible, unmoored, and misunderstood, just like I felt when I was their age. But like them, I had many hopes and dreams, and my biggest dream of all was to grow up and become a writer and write books that people loved and cared about. Thank you for being part of my dream come true. And finally, I present the winner of the 2021 John Newberry Medal, When You Trap a Tiger, written by Tay Keller, published by Random House Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Random House Children's Books, a division of Penguin Random House. This is a tender family story of love, loss, growing up, and family secrets with a dash of magic. Through Hamani's Korean folk tales, Lily learns how stories can help us share our past and shape our future. Oh my goodness. The Newberry speech. This is a little intimidating. And I've spent the past few months wondering what exactly a Newberry speech should contain. I wondered if I should mention that this all feels a little impossible. I wondered if I should talk about how I called my family as soon as I'd heard, told them I'd won, and then immediately worried I'd hallucinated the whole thing. What if, I asked my husband, I got it all wrong and I didn't actually win, and now my whole family is going to be watching. We have a wonderful family, he said soothingly. And unfortunately, we would never be able to see them again because you would never live that down. It was a nerve wracking few hours before the live announcement. But of course, I shouldn't say that in my Newbury speech. Mostly, as I wrote draft after draft, I wondered how anything I said could possibly live up to the epicness of winning the Newbury. 
in truth, it couldn't. And after many crumpled up, not entirely epic speech drafts, I stopped trying to write a speech. Because anyway, this virtual format doesn't feel very speech-like. This year feels different. Instead of standing at a podium, I am sitting at my writing desk, the same one that has seen me through various drafts of various projects. And I am sitting in this chair, the same one I sat in when the committee told me over Zoom that I'd won. The same chair I sat in just moments later when I logged off and burst into ugly tears. Considering I am wearing fuzzy house slippers, a speech feels a little too formal. So let's forget for a moment what this banquet might have looked like in another world. Because in this world, you're here in my home. Imagine you are sitting across from me, drinking tea, swapping stories, sharing gossip, and if we're sharing gossip, we might as well start with Jonda McNair. The first thing you should know about the chair of the Newberry Committee is that she's very nice. When I'd pictured a hypothetical Newberry chair, I'd envisioned someone stoic and stern, like a British school teacher who might narrow their eyes at a book and say, why is this author so fond of the umdosh? But Jonda is joyful and warm and not, in fact, British. She was generous enough to repeat herself during the call when she introduced herself and my brain short-circuited and I said, wait, what? Can you say that again? And a few months later, she invited me to a virtual visit with her class, which brings me to the second thing you should know, which is that she asks some tough questions. During the visit, she started with a big one, asking, what does the tiger represent? Now, in her defense, this probably shouldn't have been such a tough question. If you're thinking something along the lines of, well, Tay, you did write a book about a magical tiger, so that might be a question a sensible writer would be prepared for. You would be correct but I am not sensible. So my response was something like, oh my God, I hope I don't give you the wrong answer. That is not the professional confidence that you hope to exude to the chair of the Newbury Committee, but we return to thing number one, which is that Jonna McNair is very nice and hopefully didn't hold the question dodging against me. In the months since though, I've kept coming back to that question. I've been thinking about the many drafts I'd written, the notebooks I'd filled, all while asking myself the same thing. What does the tiger mean? In each revision of this book, I tried to layer in meaning. Identity, courage, death, hope. I imagined readers finding the themes in Lily's journey that speak to them. I pictured them holding those ideas to their heart while gently setting down the rest. But for me, the tiger has always represented one question. Why do we tell stories? If the tiger was haunting Lily, it was haunting me too. A challenge, a dare. Why do we tell stories? Most writers, even the least sensible of them, are prepared to answer why we write. When people ask, I say, I write because writing is the thing that makes me feel most like myself. Or in another day, I might say, I write because hearing that I made an impact on just one reader's life makes it worth it. Or, on a slightly less noble day, I might say, I write because it's my job and I need to eat. But why I write 
and why we tell stories are not the same question. And when I try to think of the tiger's real question, I don't think about readers or plot arcs or my livelihood. I think of my hominy. I think about late nights when I was a kid and she was staying with us. I think about those nights when I felt trapped by the walls of my heart, when I longed for something bigger, when I was so filled with feeling that I thought I might burst. Those nights, I would wake my sister and we would slip into Hominy's room, begging for a story. Curled up next to her, we'd wait for the words, long, long ago when Tiger walked like man. And then for a moment, we'd be somewhere else. These stories took us to Korea, a country I'd only visited once. And then even further to a world where tigers could speak and little girls could shapeshift. With my hominy's words, my heart expanded. My universe expanded. So much existed beyond Nabele Street in Waipahu, Hawaii. Though I couldn't have articulated it, I believed then that this was why we told stories. To remind ourselves that the world is big and bright and full of possibility. And that is true, but it isn't the whole truth. Because when I try to answer the tiger's question, when I try to understand why stories really matter, I also think of another day, years later, I'd left Hawaii for the mainland, but I was home for a few weeks, visiting, and I couldn't shake the feeling of loss, a sense that, somehow, I'd left myself behind when I left the islands. Suddenly, the world felt far too big, and I couldn't find myself inside of it. Not knowing what else to do, I asked my hominy to teach me to make kimchi as if the familiar flavor would bring me home, as if a recipe could be a guidebook. Here, these are the ingredients that make you who you are. Of course, it wasn't the Napa cabbage or the salt or even the goju garu that brought me home. It was the stories. Because as my hominy cooked, she began to speak. She told stories I'd never heard before about her childhood in Gime, Korea, when she felt trapped by the walls of her heart. She told me about immigrating to the U.S., moving with young children to a country that felt so big and so foreign that she couldn't find herself inside of it. For much of my life, stories had been a fantastical escape. They would let me become someone different. But that day, stories did something else. They connected me to her, to my family, to my heritage. They bridged Gime, Korea, and Waipahu, Hawaii, and in doing so, this impossibly huge world felt small again. They felt connected. It's, and I thought, that was the real answer. We tell stories because they connect us to the world and guide us back to ourselves. Stories show us who we are, and without stories, who are we? It's the truth, but it's not the whole truth. I'm lucky enough that my hominy is still with us, but we see the signs. We know that our time is not infinite. And when she tells stories now, I feel the need to hold them tight because I know the day is coming when that's all I'll have left of her. I feel it, that lack of time. And I know she does too, and I know my family does too. And I wrote a whole book hoping it would prepare me, but of course it hasn't. The thing is, 
Over the past few years, her stories have started to change. They've shapeshifted as she's begun to lose her memory. And it scares me because without her stories, who is she? Who am I? For the first time in my life, I have felt betrayed by stories because what if they don't last? What if they're not enough? There is a strange thing about winning this award in a year defined in so many ways by loss and uncertainty. I believe so wholly in stories and I want so badly to sit here and say that stories will save us. But right now, we don't know that that's the whole truth. Sitting at the dinner table or on Zoom with my sister and my parents, talking story about harmony has shown me that stories cannot always change our reality. No matter how many stories we tell, one day we will lose her. But it has also shown me that stories can make our reality a little better. Because telling stories, hearing stories, breaks down the walls of our hearts. It bridges not only continents, but also the islands of individual experience. In stories, I see that I am not alone in my grief and my fear. I'm not even alone in my hope. So that is the truth I hold to my heart. When we are young and dreaming of a bigger universe, when we are growing up and feeling lost in the world, when we are grieving terrible sorrows, stories show us that we are not alone. And if that's not enough, it's something. It has gotten me through. More than anything else, I am grateful. I am grateful that I get to tell stories. I am grateful to the storytellers who have come before me. I am grateful to be in a community that cares about stories as much as I do. And I am grateful that you have let me sit here, giving me time to answer a question that has no answer. But our time is not infinite. So let's imagine for a moment that this cozy afternoon tea has grown into a house party. We're all together now, and I'd like to speak to some people specifically. To my wonderful family. I don't know how I got so lucky to call you my own, but I don't know what I'd do without you. Thank you for making me laugh when writing feels impossible. Thank you for believing in me when all I want to do is quit. And thank you for reading all of my bad first drafts and telling me they are great. You are all terrible liars and I love you so much. To my publishing team at Greenhouse Literary Agency and Random House, what a wonderful joy it has been to work with people who truly love children's books. And to my editor, Chelsea Eberly, thank you for refusing to give up on this story. To Jonda McNair, thank you for asking that question. I hope I answered it well enough. And to the whole Newbery committee, I don't know what to say except, oh my goodness. I would say that you've made my dreams come true, but the truth is I never let myself dream this big. The morning after the announcement, I wrote in my journal, if I just accomplished the biggest thing possible, is it time to stop dreaming or is it finally time to start? Thank you for showing me that I can dream and that I can dream big. To the Asian American community, I would like to speak to you for a moment. 
When You Trap a Tiger opens with Lily saying, I can turn invisible. I wrote that when I was drawing on my own experience. And I didn't realize until this past year just how common that feeling was in our community. But I don't want to be invisible anymore. I don't want any of us to be invisible anymore. And I am so honored to be at this house party with Christina Soon Tornbot and Erin Entrada Kelly, writers I've admired for many years who are telling not just Asian stories, but Southeast Asian stories, a demographic that has been unforgivably underrepresented in our media. And I'm grateful to the many Asian writers who have inspired me and continue to inspire me. But we still need more stories and we need to champion those stories. So now to the librarians, this is your conference and I'd like to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. We live in a society that doesn't value your work enough, and I want you to know that I see you and I am grateful. Thank you for sharing stories. Thank you for sharing diverse stories. Please keep doing it. Because stories matter. They make our worlds both bigger and smaller. They let us escape and they bring us back home. They comfort us and they push us out of our comfort zones. They show us that our individual voice matters and also that we are part of a much bigger community. They show us that we are not alone. And now, after a year that has often felt isolating, I am grateful to be here, not at all alone. Thank you for reading this story about a magical tiger and a lonely, quiet, hopeful girl. Thank you for seeing it and celebrating it and turning it into a house party. Good evening, members of the American Library Association, Association of Library Services to Children. I'm Junko Yokota, Chair of the Legacy Award Committee. The ALA Ask Legacy Award honors an author or an illustrator whose books published in the United States have made a significant and lasting contribution to literature for children through books that demonstrate integrity and respect for all children's lives and experiences. Mildred Taylor is the winner of the 2021 Children's Literature Legacy Award. Her award-winning books include Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, which won the 1977 Newbery Medal, and the Coretta Scott King Honor Award. The Friendship, Road to Memphis, and The Land, all recipients of the Coretta Scott King Award. Her final book about the Logan family, All the Days Past, All the Days to Come, was named a 2021 Coretta Scott King Honor Book. In addition to numerous awards for individual books, Mildred Taylor is the recipient of the 2020 Coretta Scott King Virginia Hamilton Award for Lifetime Achievement. Mildred Taylor's childhood of listening to family stories told by her father and uncles at the Mississippi Family Homestead guided her journey in becoming a writer. Weaving elements from her family history Taylor's lifelong work has been the telling of the Logan family saga across 10 books that span generations. Grounded in family loyalty and love, each generation faces seemingly unsurmountable challenges, yet meets them with resilience. Powerful stories tell the impact of racism and are presented in the details of day-to-day -day bullying and injustices, such as the denial of human rights, legalized segregation, civil rights, and more. Taylor's stories are important for readers today 
so that we may understand how the past influences our present and can also influence the future. Most importantly, themes of family, love, friendships, and perseverance prevail. The 2021 Legacy Award Committee met throughout the 2020 year and studied the rich legacy of many potential honorees. We found that Mildred Taylor shows how courage, dignity, and family love endure amidst racial injustice and continues to enlighten hearts and minds of readers through the decades. We thank ALSK for the honor and the privilege of having served on the 2021 Legacy Award Committee and congratulate Mildred Taylor. Thank you, American Library Association, for honoring my work with the Children's Literature Legacy Award. This most prestigious award is bestowed as my career is ending. In 1975, the year my first book was published, my career was just beginning. I had been preparing for my writing career for many years before, however, actually from the time I was a child, always listening to my family's stories about our heritage, about the lives of my family and the people of their community in rural Mississippi. I heard the stories in my Ohio home where I grew up and in Mississippi where I was born and where my father, mother, sister, and I returned each year. When the stories were told, they were told with such force, with such drama, as the storytellers acted out the characters in their stories in voice and movement, that they made all who listened a part of the stories, and all who listened were moved by them. Stories like those told by my family were not then included in the school books I read as a child. What I learned in school was a lackluster history of black people, of people who, according to the text, were totally devoid of any heroic or pride-building qualities. It was a history of the people who were enslaved, of people who were docile, and childlike, accepting their fate without once attempting to free themselves. The history I learned at home through the stories denied that falsehood, and I was enthralled by them. From that beginning came the seeds for me to write the stories I had heard. Throughout the years I was growing up and Later, after my graduation from college and after I had lived in Africa, I attempted to write the stories, and I repeatedly submitted them to publishers, but they were always rejected. It was not until I submitted a manuscript that would become the novella, Son of the Trees, to a contest sponsored by the Council on Interracial Books for Children that publishers took note of my work. The story was based on the cutting of trees on my family's Mississippi land when my father was a boy. Previously, I had written the story from a boy's point of view and also from the boy's grandmother's point of view. Publishers rejected it. Then, Cassie Logan emerged a girl based on my aunt, my sister, and myself. Through Cassie, the Logan family came to life on the written page. For readers, the Logan family is fiction, but to me, they are real people. For each member of the Logan family I describe is drawn from a, a, mem a member of my family, and the land I describe was my family's land. After Son of the Trees came Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. The core story of my first novel is based on a story my father and uncle told me about a black boy who became involved with two white boys and was almost lynched. In Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, 
I included the teachings of my own childhood, the values and principles by which I and so many other black children were reared. For I want to show a different kind of black world from the one then so often portrayed. I wanted to show a family united in love and self-respect and parents strong and sensitive attempting to guide their children successfully without harming their spirits through the hazardous maze of living in a discriminatory society. I wanted to show black people as heroic, heroes and heroines missing from the school books of my childhood. I continued this mission in all the Logan books that followed. Let the circle be unbroken, the gold Cadillac, the friendship, Mississippi Bridge, the road to Memphis, the well, and the land. Finally, almost 20 years after the land, I finished the story I set out to tell. In 1976, when World of Thunder Hear My Cry was published, I knew that I wanted to take the children in the book to adulthood, into the events of World War II, through the Great Migration, and into the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. Also, in 1976, when my father died, I knew the final scene of the final book and wrote a version of it then. All the days past, all the days to come is that final book. In this book, I included people and events of my own generation, and once again, I followed much of my family's history. It is a book I did not write for children or even young adults. As in the writing of all my books, I simply wrote the story. However, with all the primary characters in the book being adults and adult situations being portrayed, I consider all the days past, all the days to come, a book for adult readers as well as for young adult readers. All the days past, all the days to come is the most difficult book I have written and one of four that is most special to me. The other three books I most prize are Sung of the Trees, because it was my first book published, The Land, because it was based on my great-grandfather's history, a history proudly told and retold by his children and grandchildren, and of course, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. My father, the greatest of the storytellers, inspired me to write Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. And a song that came to me during my most difficult days writing the book inspired the title. My father did not live to see the publication of Roll of Thunder, Roll of Thunder Hear My Cry, but his words, his stories, and the stories told by all my family live on through the book I have writ written. The Children's Literature Legacy Award gives recognition to my body of work based on those stories. My recognition of my work is to my family and to the millions of African Americans whose stories are sewn into the fabric of America. Without my father's words, without my family's stories, without their teachings, my books would not have been. I owe all to them. Um, that concludes this year's celebration. ALSK's network of members share knowledge, evaluate books, 
and media for young people and advocate for better library service to children. I encourage you to stay connected with the Association for Library Service to Children by visiting our website where you can learn more about our awards and work. Last but not least, I would like to officially begin the Newberry Medal 100th anniversary celebration. From now until annual conference 2022, join ALSC, its members, and all lovers of children's literature in celebrating a century of distinguished books. Please visit the Newberry 100 website to learn all about our plans, including commemorative artwork from past Newberry recipients. I am sincerely grateful to all who could attend to celebrate this year's Newberry, Caldecott, and Legacy honorees. I'm Susan Polos, Chair of the Newberry 100th Anniversary Celebration Task Force. After such lovely speeches from this year's recipients, I am thrilled to reveal original takes on the Newberry 100 logo from past Newberry recipients. These pieces are absolutely bursting with their creator's talent and style. Thank you to Cece Bell. Jerry Kraft. Kevin Hankus. Victoria Jamison. and Grace Lynn. Merchandise featuring these pieces is available now at the ALA Graphics Gift Shop. This summer celebration starts with you. We'd love to have you share your favorite Newberry books, memories, and more on social media using hashtag Newberry100. More announcements to come soon. Cheers to 100 years of distinguished children's literature.